to an oral history of the church. I'm Adam Christman. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An oral history of the church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Here we go. Last week, we discussed tertiary sources. Uh, Scholarship is a sort of conversation. It's easy to get lost if you don't have someone guiding you. Tertiary sources are what invite you into the conversation. Uh, These are going to be dictionaries, encyclopedias, um, atlases, and books like that. Uh, They help you find what is important in the primary and secondary sources when you're doing history. Yeah. If you didn't listen to our episode on primary and secondary sources, these are the tools that you use to build uh, your historical argument. Right. And if you want to know what those are, uh, those episodes are already available. And as far as I know, we'll uh, perpetually be available. (laughs) Unless our distributor shuts down in some tragic accident or whatever, which they won't. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so we have two episodes you can go listen to on those items. But this time around, we're going to discuss social sciences and how they relate to history, doing history. Um, they cross-pollinate all the time. A lot of books that do social sciences or that do history, uh, when they when they perform the other task, may not even mention. Hey, by the way, we're going to get into some economics specifically right now, or what have you. It'll often flow back and forth, and you'll have to notice it on your own. But let's define first off what we mean by the social sciences. The social sciences include what I called poli-sci when I went to college, so political science, the the study of politics. It includes economics, it includes anthropology, law, sociology, and social psychology. All of these areas within the social sciences are, are used as a kind of lens when we when we're doing historical work so really anything besides uh projections you know by futurists or uh or what have you is essentially a a cross between one of these social sciences areas and history even if it's recent history so um maybe you want to study the economics of the papacy you want to know what's up with how money was brought in and how it was spent during the medieval era so that you can better understand what was going on in the Reformation era when people are complaining about this and that as how the church collected its money or spent its money. Sociology, how uh, a society moves and thinks and changes over time or or law, uh, if you want to look at when new laws were enacted, major new laws, let's say you want to understand the history behind the legalization of Christianity under Emperor Constantine. What precisely did that look like? What, What does that mean? Was it legalized as in this is now a lawful religion? Or was it made the state religion? Is that what it means? Was it the official religion of the state? Or perhaps something else? So these are all different areas. Uh, All these different areas are lenses by which we can glimpse a part of history to try and understand what was going on at that time. Within the social sciences, there are two big methodologies there are qualitative and quantitative um, methods. 
So qualitative looks intently at one particular event Mm. or one particular uh, cultural artifact, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or one very small, one person, if you're looking at psychology. Mm. Quantitative methodologies will look at broad themes. So it's going to look at uh, a group of people or a practice over a long period of time, not just one specific event. Right. So you'll, it'll take in a lot more data and you'll, you'll, you'll see more trends in those uh, movements or uh, whatever it is that you're following as opposed to uh, qualitative, where you get more of the the essence of that particular piece that you're studying. Now, history is its own discipline, but it is, well, um, it can be a field encompassing field. So each mm-hmm. of these fields has their own history. Mm-hmm. As we said earlier, there are the three canons. History is when you're trying to answer a historical question for your contemporary audience. Mm -hmm. So these other tools may be describing a political event, a social trend, something like that. History is going to try to look at the causes and effects and communicate it to a new audience. This is part of why um, you you see such overlap in writings between people who are using social science methodologies Mm -hmm. when they start doing history. It's Mm -hmm. because that is the application of their work. Yeah. Sometimes when we're working with our primary sources and with our secondary sources, we will find out that there is portions that we would want an answer to that are simply not recorded. Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's definitely true. A quote that I read in an Anabaptist letter from one church to another gave instructions not to record the names of of either the itinerant minister or the people housing um, housing the itinerant ministers so that if they were caught and captured they wouldn't know the names Mm -hmm. Uh, and they couldn't give up um, the other person to protect the community yeah Sometimes these holes are intentional holes in the primary sources, and those holes tell us something. And then there are those that are unintentional, that is a a question not asked by the people writing these accounts, but that we have. Uh, sometimes we have questions that they had no interest in answering. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the There are times where we might say, hey, what did Jesus write there on the ground? Uh, yeah. The and Gospels don't say. That's right. If John, If we were asking the Apostle John, he might say, what do you care? That's not the point. <laughs> or what does it matter? The point of the story is... You know, and then he would move on to the, this is the right, why I shared this story. Yeah, that that kind of thing happens all the time. You have all these gaps that you want to fill. You want to know, why is this that way? How did that happen? Who is this person? So some, the social sciences give us a best guess on why there is a whole and what might have been in the hole. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, 
in without having a primary source recording what happened it is just that it is a an educated guess based on evidence what might have been the thinking of the historical figure uh, who left the record and why they left this gap. Right. Based on this factor and that factor, we think this. One example of uh, social science attempt to answer a historical question is sitting in my hands right now, actually. I checked it out from my seminary's library to help me out with my dissertation. Um, it's from a monograph series, so that means two things for why this is not on my book recommendation list later in the episode. One, it's ex more expensive. <laughs> and two, it's, it's as niche as niche can be. So unless you are particularly interested in an academic... Um, study of this question I, it, you have no need to look up this book but the book I'm talking about is called The Pauline Church and the Corinthian Ecclesia Greco-Roman Associations in Comparative Context by Richard Last this book is essentially a social sciences question the first chapters of the book especially deal with how they how we are to ask the question how do we compare first century Christian churches with Greco-Roman associations? First of all, dear listener, just to define a couple of things, Greco-Roman associations refers to any official group that comes together to um, accomplish a certain purpose, uh, and it, there, were, uh, there was a variety of these. There were often uh, neighborhood associations where essentially people paid dues and had officers in charge of the association in order to kind of take care of everybody in that neighborhood. So this made sure that yes, people... Yes, your just... homeowners... Is... Yeah, exactly. A homeowners association, but not necessarily for homeowners. <laughs> Back in the first century, just to continue with this, this example, so that you knew you would get a burial if you died and and other things of this nature um i read i've read a primary source about uh, a salt merchants guild so it's a it's an association that came together to make sure that nobody undercut anybody else with a lower price so that they could clear out all of their stock and make a bunch of money real fast and therefore hurt all the other salt merchants in the area um so there's various Greco-Roman yes. associations. They came together for particular purposes to help each other out. Um, so there is a debate. How do first century churches um, line up with Greco-Roman associations? Are, there, are they extremely similar? Are they extremely different? Or something else? So um, this author, Richard Last, argues that the debate is poorly framed up until recent history because the framing is judgmental on Greco-Roman associations as inherently inferior to Christian churches. And he prefers the Greek term ekklesia to try and even the playing field. So he uses ekklesia. I want to go ahead and say church because that's I'm pretty sure more of my listeners are um, far more familiar with English terms than Greek. <clears throat> um, so he, he asks the question, how do they compare? And he wants to compare them fairly without giving uh, undue advantage to first century churches simply because they are Christian churches. So from his perspective, Christian churches were essentially Greco-Roman associations specifically a hero cult kind of Greco-Roman association. It's just that the hero they chose to worship was this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> and then his, 
his comparison doesn't come down to how the associations, both the Christian ones and non-Christian ones, generally treated each other because he thinks that there's not enough primary sources about the Christian churches to know about their actual day-to-day -day behavior towards each other. He thinks there's plenty of primary sources in the scriptures about the ideals, about that which was the, the, the best way, the way that the Apostle Paul or Peter hoped that they would live, wanted them to live that way. But he says that there's not enough evidence either in the scriptures or outside of the scriptures to indicate clearly, one way or another, how these Christian churches really actually behaved towards one another in their day-to-day -day lives. So his comparison comes down to three factors. One, how did these associations, both the Christian ecclesia and the non-Christian Greco-Roman associations, how do they select officers? So in a religious context, how do they pick the priest? And the second being, what did they do about membership fees or subscription dues? Um, what did they collect? How did they collect it? How much did they collect? These sorts of questions. Um, and he asks, that one is a particular question for him because um, he thinks that it's unreasonable to consider that first century Christian churches didn't have membership dues. He thinks it's unreasonable to think that these churches did all of this mystery just kind of for free everywhere. Rather, he thinks that in order to provide food for the love feast or to provide uh, other financial help for the widow or the orphan or whatever, that this money came from what he calls and what he thinks we all should call uh, membership dues. So that's the second prong of his his research is membership dues. And then the third being what do the what did these associations do regarding honorariums? How did they celebrate or honor the officers that they selected? Um, do they make them uh, a laurel? Do they uh, give them a monetary gift or do they do something else uh, like put down some some uh, tablet or obelisk or some other thing that uh, eventually became one of our primary sources to read about that 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 era um, or nothing at all what did they do exactly so as a social sciences experiment Richard last asks how do the how did the Corinthian ecclesia in particular line up with other Greco-Roman associations with regards to those three practices, or typical practices at least, among Greco-Roman associations. So I think you can, you, you, you can see how this would fill gaps in what we know about um, Christian ecclesias, <laughs> Christian churches especially, um, as well as Greco-Roman associations. So this book is an example of a social sciences experiment where he tries to find out, in part, how did first century Christian churches finance all of the ministries that they did? That's not the only question he, he seeks to answer. It's a, that's a kind of a sub-question, but this is, an, this is an economic question. This is a, a sociological question. How did these churches finance the ministries that they did? And he, so he, he digs through the primary sources and the secondary sources, mostly primary sources, to try and, and answer this question, to fill this gap that we don't have. We know from the scriptures that, especially from the book of Acts, that the Apostle Paul and others took up a collection for the church in Jerusalem because they were suffering over there at that time. But what did they do at the other churches? What did they do for the, the, the poor, for the outcast, for the widow and the orphan in Thessalonica and in Philadelphia or Laodicea? Uh, 
What do they do there? So he's trying to get a Corinthian angle on that question in this book. So this is this is one example of how a social science approach to history is an attempt to fill a gap left by the primary sources. Social sciences aren't inherently pro-Christian or anti-Christian. Right. Uh, they're simply an attempt to try to fill in holes in the in the source material that we have. Right. Exactly. So they're good and helpful, but they aren't the end all. If you want to understand a period of history or a person from history, um, you you need history and social sciences. You can't just do, you can't just ask a social science question, and know everything you need to know about that moment or person or, or movement in history. There's a tendency on both the theologically conservative and the theological avant-garde uh, to over overstate the significance of some of the social sciences. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes someone will say, archaeology proves that Joshua conquered Jericho. Right. Well, archaeology proves that Jericho fell in a time period that might fit when the biblical text says Joshua was in, in the land. <laughs> right. Archaeology proves very little. And that's across the board. Archaeology provides a lot of primary sources. It does not provide proof. Now, it will give us really cool things that may support the biblical text. Yeah. Uh, we can find coins with the, the inscription that says, Solomon, son of David. Right. Or Quirinius. Uh, the, the guy who gets one mention in uh, the the Lucan birth narrative of Jesus. Uh, for a little while in the 20th century, uh, it was questioned that Quirinius was even a person, whether that guy even existed. And then um, archaeology found a coin with that name uh, relative to a, a, a government position term. And so it's very likely that the mention in the Lucan birth narrative is accurate. It's very likely that this means that, well, yeah, there was a guy named Quirinius who filled that role generally in that period in history. So, yeah, it's probably accurate. But again, it's not proof. Oh. It's not videotape. It's not a fingerprint. You know? And what it doesn't do is it doesn't prove the virgin birth. Right. Right, exactly. It really can't prove anything. Archaeology gives us primary sources to interpret. It doesn't give us proof. So even, even if we got yet another boat, let's say, <laughs> yet another piece of wood that was uh, definitely cut by human hands and shaped into some object and happens to be somewhere uh, on Mount Ararat or somewhere else, in that part of the Middle East, uh, because there have that been several. Even if we find another one, and we test that wood with carbon dating, which is not 100% reliable anyway, but even if we test it with carbon dating, we say, oh, look, see, it was this many years ago. This must be the Ark. That is a piece of evidence that is interpreted. It does not prove anything. A, an example that I am freely stealing from uh, one of our professors, um, <laughs> uh, archaeology professor, in fact, uh, there are scenes in um, 
Indiana Jones in the Indiana Jones series that are true to historical context. Mm. There really were Nazi book burnings right. um, before and during World War II. Mm-hmm. Was there a professor, Dr. Jones, who got a journal signed by Adolf Hitler? <laughs> no. What? <clears throat> I'm very disappointed, Jonathan. Just as the sociolog- the social science accuracy of Nazis burning books verifies that Indiana Jones is a well-written period piece, mm-hmm. it doesn't make the Bible history or not history in of itself. We need more than just the social sciences right. to make right. the Bible or any other historical section that we're looking at right. reliable. Right. Yeah. There is a tendency within um, within church history to have something we called call pseudepigrapha. Mm-hmm. Uh, falsely attributed writings. Right, so so I'm Adam, and I would write something under the name Solomon, because I wanted somebody to think along the lines of King Solomon, wise King Solomon, who built the Lord's Temple, or something like mo- that, and then you would read my document. Yeah. Mostly, the social sciences can show when something doesn't fit this normal pattern. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's a disqualification and lets us know it's a mm-hmm. pseudepigraphal writing. This wasn't really written by John Chrysostom. This wasn't mm-hmm. really written by Solomon because mm-hmm. it's a long time afterward. Right. Sometimes this incongruity is telling us something in the event. Mm-hmm. Um, so in Mark... Jesus goes through uh, Sidon, uh, Tyre and Sidon to go to Galilee. You could use it to say Mark didn't know Palestinian geography. Mm-hmm. Or you can say Jesus took a roundabout way because he was visiting people on his journey. Or oh. he was avoiding people. Right. Or you could say, Mark arranged it this way. He wanted this story to precede that story, and then that story, because he wanted a certain flow in the story to story. Another another uh, example from uh, biblical studies that, that illustrates the use of social sciences in understanding history. Um, when someone writes, and they, especially when they write a narrative, there are a lot of details or social elements that don't get put down because the writer is assuming that the the reader or the listener would know this or would be aware of it. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, Jesus is thirsty and he's next to a well, or he's near a well. Why he's not getting his own water, I don't know. Maybe there's a crowd. That's another gap that we don't know. (laughs) But what we do know is that a woman came up to the well to get water. We know that she was Samaritan. We know what Samaritan means. That means... uh, when the kingdom of Israel split and then when each the northern and then the southern kingdom were conquered there was a large group of Israelites the common people who were not shipped away into exile but that remained in the land and when the conquerors brought their own people in to rule they intermarried 
and as a result of the theology or social psychology, maybe, that developed during that period after the exile began, those who went out, those who went through the exile by going to Assyria or by going to Babylon or wherever, the, the theology developed, or the social psychology developed, that the people who didn't go through the exile didn't get purified by the exile process but rather they intermarried with these Gentiles. Not just Gentiles, but Gentile conquerors of our people. So, from their perspective, this new race began, the Samaritan race, in, especially in northern Israel. Uh, so this is a, a, a racist consideration. This was, um, this was a separate race, a separate class from anyone who went to the exile, and then their their descendants came back to the land after the exile. Um, these these two groups did not mingle, or they did not mingle well. Um, it was it was not common for an upstanding, proper Jewish rabbi, Jewish teacher of any sort, Jesus kind of fulfilling each of those roles, depending on your perspective. It was not proper for him to interact with a Samaritan in the first place. Um, you know, that's that's not the holiest thing he could do. Even worse would it be for him to chit-chat with a, a woman to whom he's not married, especially a Samaritan woman to whom he is not married. But here's Jesus by the well. This woman has come to the well to get water, and he begins talking to her. She seems like she's scandalized at first, like she's trying to obey the social norms. Hey, we don't talk. You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. This is not how we do things, dude. You know that. But he he presses on, and he makes his point about living water, and and so on as the as the narrative goes. Now, what the social sciences provide us is they give us um, an, a sociological understanding uh, or an anthropological, perhaps, understanding um, that, that doesn't come across in John's description. John does not take the time to tell his readers all of that stuff I just said about the northern and southern kingdoms going into exile and then and then those who stayed intermingling and, and this racist tension that the Jews had towards Samaritans, and uh, as well as the, the, the tension between uh, how men were to interact with women uh, to whom they weren't married. He doesn't explain all that. You can look for it. It's not there. What the social sciences do is they fill that gap in the primary source for us. They, they tell us these things. They say, hey, look, if you look around at these other primary sources here and here and here, you can see this trend that men were not to speak to women to whom they weren't married, generally speaking. And uh, you can see here and here how this uh, theology developed or how this social psychology developed about how Jews were to respond to Samaritans and so on. So um, this is another example of actually how social sciences can can benefit us. I'm sorry, I was I was circling back to, you were talking about overreactions, and um, I have actually forgotten how my point I just made connects with what you were saying. <laughs> we, but I think it's good uh, enough. We're going to leave it in, Johnny Mac. We're going to leave it in. Uh, <laughs> leave it in. It's good stuff. Um, there is a tendency on, the, on both the left and the right to say that social sciences can do more or less than what it can actually do. Mm -hmm. They want it to be a primary source. Right. And what it does, it, it bridges gaps, um, gaps in the data. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to reevaluate our, our understanding of the social sciences and, 
if we find more primary source and secondary source data. Right. Or if we think that it's a weak interpretation of the primary and secondary source data. Exactly. Some social science texts will come to this conclusion, and because that fits my narrative that I prefer, I'm going to go with this. I think it's this one. But then there's another social science book that says, no, no, we need to understand the trend this way based on how this other evidence is more important than the evidence that the other person said. And so um, we have to keep that in mind as well. Are you ready to get into recommendations, Johnny Mac? Yes. Um, there are some things that we would recommend. Uh, bear in mind, uh, some of these may be a little specialized and a little on the pricey end. That's right. Yes. Uh, these will be a little more specialized as our podcast always is. We are more interested in specifically church history and uh, because I keep... Uh, bringing it up, uh, biblical studies, <laughs> biblical history, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, the first book I'm going to mention is a general book on social science methodology. Um, it's also a textbook for social and behavioral science methodology. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good book, um, but it's going to be on the pricey end, and it's a master's level textbook. Research design, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method approaches by John Crestwell. I think it's um, currently in its fourth it's edition. Really, yeah, it's a really top-notch uh, textbook. Um, that being said, because it's a top-notch textbook, you're also fighting with... Uh, uh, other students to try to get a hold of this <laughs> if you're going to try to buy it. Yeah. So find yourself a good uh, ebook copy, perhaps, or uh, perhaps a used copy, only because uh, I only say that because that's what I would do if I were buying that right now. Um, <laughs> it's about 80 bucks normally. Yeah. So brand new, I should say. Well, I have one that I'd like to, to offer next. Um, this is a series from a publisher called IVP. It's the IVP Bible Dictionary series. So if you want to understand more about the, the world of the Bible, they have both an Old Testament series and a New Testament series. Uh, I believe both of them are four volumes uh, each. So this, if you get all of them, it would be eight total volumes. Um, Correct. They're, they're edited by Joel Green. The, uh, the first one in the New Testament series is called Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, a compendium, a compendium of contemporary biblical scholarship. So this is uh, a tertiary source, just like we talked about in our previous episode. It is a dictionary with articles about all kinds of things, this and that. You can look things up as regards slavery in that era or goodness uh food and drink <laughs> if you want to try to understand perhaps the lord's supper a bit more or um greco-roman associations those sorts of things like we talked about earlier there are all kinds of as we talked about in our tertiary sources episode there's all kinds of articles or essays in a dictionary like this but uh the, these books give you in those articles they're going to give you a lot of um historical stuff, a lot of social sciences stuff that you can really sink your teeth into to start to understand the, the, the history, the setting, the context in the world of uh, these biblical books or these biblical narratives. So that's my first recommendation. Another book that does similar things, uh, it's uh, pretty devoted to New Testament work, again. Uh, Honor, Patronage, Kinship, and Purity, Unlocking the New Testament Culture uh, by David De Silva. Um, it's a nice book on the uh, social order in the New Testament era. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, good book. I I highly recommend it. And De Silva does a lot of um, very high quality work. Yes, he would be a good scholar to follow. Um, my next suggestion is an Old Testament related resource. This is one I've I've read um, most of the way through a couple of times. It's a uh, it's not really a history book so much as it is a collection of primary sources. It's called Old Testament Parallels, Laws and Stories from the Ancient Near East. It's currently in, I think it's third edition? Possibly third edition. fourth. I, I believe there's a fourth edition in the works, um, but it's not out yet. Gotcha. Well, um, either way, it's called Old Testament Parallels, but it's written, not written so much as collected, and edited by Victor H. Matthews and Don C. Benjamin. So this book is, uh, as the subtitle kind of clarifies, these are laws, recorded laws, or stories from the ancient Near East, so it's that region of the world, and in that time period. And they uh, are those which parallel in some way Old Testament laws and stories. So there are flood narratives from Babylon and so on in this book, and you can read those as a kind of parallel. How does it compare to the flood narrative in Genesis 6 and following? Uh, There are laws here, so you can compare, read them and compare them with either the Ten Commandments or with the whole of the the Mosaic Law, if you want. Uh, There are all kinds of stories, all kinds of laws collected in this book, and it's it's it makes for some very interesting reading, um, which for me has resulted in uh, considering Old Testament laws as actually kind of liberating compared to those of their neighbors. Um, that there was more more freedom and mercy for uh, everyone across the board. Um, compared to most, if not all, of the these laws that I, I read in here. And then even in the narratives, it's interesting to see um, the the similarities and differences there. Uh, I could keep going, but I won't. It's, it's just a very interesting book. Um, if you are curious, you can look it up on, on Amazon or wherever. Old Testament Parallels by Victor Matthews and Don Benjamin. Well, I have another one, Jonathan. Uh, this one is by an author named Ben Witherington III. Now, this dude is... He's the definition of prolific in biblical studies. He comes out with at least a book a year, or at least that's how it seems. Uh, he has a lot of books, so uh, if you just Google his name, that that's not going to get you right to this book. It will get you to good stuff, but not right to this particular book. Uh, there's a book called Invitation to the New Testament. There's uh, another one about the Old Testament written by somebody else. Um, this is a an, a an introduction to the world of the New Testament to help you understand things like what's the deal with Samaritans or how did men and women interact in ancient Israel and so on. Um, so if you look up Invitation to the New Testament by Ben Witherington III, You'll find a good introductory resource. This is more college textbook level uh, there. There's a there's one another one that's um, along a similar line, uh, and in fact, it uses the same painting <laughs> on its book <laughs> cover with different framing. But anyway, it's called "Studying the Historical Jesus: A Guide to Sources and Methods." This is by author Daryl Bach, who is also very good. Um, I I read anything that he puts out. This is a a 2002 book, so it's a little older. Um, It is probably out of print at this point. But um, you may have heard of the Historical Jesus uh, movement or quest for the Historical Jesus. It's it's a a question that started mostly in the... uh, in the 19th century, 
trying to find out who really was Jesus because we can't really trust the New Testament to tell us the full story or an honest or the as honest a story as we can find. Uh, we could do episode after episode about that, so I, I'll try not to go into too much detail. But if you want to kind of get a handle from a conservative leaning scholar who um, believes in the scriptures and believes therefore with his hermeneutic of trust that they're trying to be honest and uh, report genuinely and as fully as they could for what they were doing um, that's his perspective that's where he's coming from um, he tries to present a balanced uh, understanding of how to go about the question for understanding the historical Jesus. Now again, his conclusions come down on uh, the biblical narratives being trustworthy, but um, it's a it's a good introductory book on how to get started if you have interests along those lines. Uh, so I'll, I'll move on. This next book that I'm going to recommend comes from the other side of the, the, the theological spectrum. Uh, we've mentioned this author before on our podcast. His name is Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman has published quite a few popular level books, as well as quite a few academic books, textbooks and others, uh, and articles and so on. So he's, he's also very prolific, just like uh, Ben Witherington III. But he comes more from uh, a hermeneutic of, of doubt when it comes to the biblical texts. However, he really lives in studying the history of that era, the New Testament era. There are few scholars today who are as well steeped, well read, well studied in early church studies. So from the first century BC up to the third, fourth, maybe even fifth, I'm not sure how how far forward his expertise goes, um, centuries AD. This book is called The New Testament, A Historical Introduction to the Early Christian Writings. He has a lot of popular books that are written about this kind of topic, but this is more a textbook uh, for use at the college level. Uh, it's in its sixth edition now. Um, this book will will do kind of the same thing that Ben Witherington's book is trying to do uh, that I mentioned before. This one focuses a little more on the, the writings, the history behind uh, writing uh, conventions at the time, the sorts of issues that he's especially interested in. Um, but still, it provides a lot of uh, social sciences and historical um, uh, data that you can you can really uh, use to get a handle on what's going on there, uh, coming from his 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 angle, his side of that spectrum. Still, well worth the the time and and the work to read it. Absolutely, uh, we should we should regularly read from people who do not agree with us. <laughs> because we learn better from the people who give us um, the better critiques sometimes. Yeah. Um, as much as I disagree with Bart Ehrman's conclusions about the New Testament and maybe some other things, he works very hard and he works very well to do what he does. And I, uh, I have to respect his work. And... Um, I read his stuff very regularly in order to, to, on my part, to do better. Uh, but that ends my book recommendations. Do you have any more, Jonathan? I think that's what I've got. Um, another book by Ehrman. <clears throat> if only um, because it talks about some of the things we talked about today. Mm -hmm. Uh he wrote a book, Forged, Writing in the Name of God. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and it's about pseudepigrapha. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't agree with all of his conclusions about his claims of some of the New Testament authors being pseudepigraphal. Right. Um, but he does give a really good definition of what pseudepigrapha is and describes some of sort of the social pressures that lead to the creation of pseudepigraphal writings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That one's written a little bit more along popular lines, is that right? Yeah, it's a it's a more popular uh, okay. work. It's, I haven't it's opened pretty, that one up yet. It's a pretty easy read. Mm-hmm. All right, well, um, let's let's start wrapping this up then, Johnny Mac. We've been going uh, a pretty good long time on this episode. Our next episode comes out uh, in two weeks as we're sticking to our, our, our schedule. Uh, and th- that'll be January 27th. Our seventh episode of this volume is going to discuss the various kinds of history writing. So, okay. You've done all this work, you've read the primary and secondary sources, you've read, you've even used tertiary sources, um, and I'm going to keep saying it because I like saying tertiary so much. Uh, so you've done that, you've, you've put social, the, you've understood the role of social sciences and, and aligned your, um, your research methods the way that you want, great. You've even understood uh, your answer to your question. How do you go about writing a history? That's what we're going to talk about next time, because there's a there's a, a few different approaches. We're going to, um, of course, share our preferred uh, perspective on it. So when you come back in two weeks, that's what we'll be talking about. You gotta put words on the page. <laughs> hey, we're not here to talk about my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions or comments about uh, our podcast, um, something that uh, you'd like us to cover more or you had uh, want a clarification on, uh, please feel free to email us at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. That's churchhistorypodcast, uh, no dots, no spaces, at gmail.com. That's right. Uh, you can also tweet us at Oral History Pod. We have a Twitter account uh, where we try to interact with various uh, uh, religious history accounts, and and uh, it is it is live, even if it's not as lively as uh, other Twitter accounts, perhaps. Um, but that's the nice thing about following it; you won't get flooded with all kinds of stuff that you don't want to see. <laughs> uh, but you can contact us there and we can answer questions or um, use those questions to answer here in an episode. We also wanted to remind you that we have a companion podcast that's been launched. Saints Gone Before is the name. We've put out quite a few episodes now, a good handful. Our latest episode, by the time this episode of An Oral History of the Church comes out, will be the letter Martin Luther wrote to Pope Leo X. 2017, as you may already know, is the 500th anniversary, the officially speaking, <laughs> of the Protestant Reformation. So uh, we've already begun with other Reformation materials, but um, this is our first, this last one was our, our first Martin Luther primary source for the podcast. And again, uh, we've mentioned this before, but just in case you've missed it, Saints Gone Before is not a commentary podcast. We don't talk about, hey, this was interesting, or this was strong, or this was weak, or whatever. It's a primary sources audiobook podcast. So if you listen to it, we'll tell you what it is, we'll read it to you, and then we'll tell you, hey, that's what that was. That's what this is, this, this show, Saints Gone Before. The next episode, so coming... On Monday, January 16th, we will begin reading Martin Luther's Concerning Christian Liberty. This is another relatively early and important Lutheran document from the Protestant Reformation. We want to make sure that we provide for you interesting and helpful uh, 
documents that go along with what we are talking about um, as we go along in our podcast. So if there's something that you would like to uh, hear us do, uh, please let us know through uh, the email we mentioned before uh, or tweet us uh, and we'll see what we can do to add that to the queue. That's right. We take requests, but not Freebird. <laughs> May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Uh-huh.